During a spelling conversation, as participants faltered on the word photo, I, from the crowd, confidently spelled it correctly, and then my first scholarship to Chufupra to kindergarten. Those early days were carefree. Yet, as I progressed academically, the atmosphere shifted. Questions like, who are you? And assumptions about my place in male-dominated settings defined my experience as a first-generation college student. Despite my family support and scholarship, my journey stands out as an anomaly. Sadly, over 99% of Muslim women lack such privileges. I yearn to be part of community where my credibility and leadership are celebrated, not questioned, and where the pathway to higher education is not a solitary endeavor. I love that. That's actually, yeah, Asha, thank, thank you very much for sharing with us. I what what I really love about that and what I think should always be in uh in an opening statement is the descriptiveness of it. So you one first of all telling us about like the hawking experience and you you, don't, you didn't just tell us you were hawking, you described it to us who you were with, and then moving on to the classroom, the classroom scene. Where you were, even okay, like so place. that wasn't a classroom scene. So, uh, it was a competition as where I was working in the school, and then they were doing a competition, spelling competition. And because I've always been selling at the back of the class, I know mm -hmm. the word, so the students couldn't spell it, and oh, I okay. spelled it, and that earned me my first scholarship to the school. Right, right. Oh, so, so that was the mimic. That was where you were mimicking. Yes, please. That's actually amazing. Yeah, and. Like I said, that is what you want to see in an opening statement. Even though there are some things in there that maybe as a as a an issue of writing style, I might I might take out. Like for instance, when when you talk about ninety nine percent of Muslim women, that is easily refutable because they would know that like of course I mean there's a good number of like Muslim women who go to school in places like in some of these places. So maybe maybe don't don't make don't give don't give statistics that cannot be backed up. And okay. don't feed in too much in. So a sub story is good, which is one of the things I'll I'll come I'll come to later. So when we say a sub story, a sub story is a story that you're basically talking about how hard it is for you, and how much you have you have like um you have scaled those hurdles, but also you don't want to sell that too much. You don't want that to make an entire persona, which you did not do. You definitely didn't do that. Your story was also a lot about resilience. And that's one of the themes that most graduate programs like to see because because of how rigorous it is, they want to see, they want to hear themes of resilience, how you how you are, you would be able to like confront whatever challenges comes your way, that is thrown your way. So I definitely love that. I definitely love that opening um opening um uh, paragraph. Thank you, thank you for sharing, Aisha. It's, someone else wants thank to share. You. Does someone else want to share? Okay, so let's move to what have you been doing so far, or the the next paragraph. Actually, if no one wants to share, more than you're more than uh, welcome to continue. Elijah. Okay, so I don't know whether this follows uh, the same thing, but then this is education and kind of okay. Let me continue. Yeah, that's right, yeah. As a okay, where my okay, as a Mastercard Foundation scholar, I actively engage with communities, promoting quality education for all under the SDG Go Four. Connecting with parents and children with backgrounds like mine during this engagement reshaped my perspective, from seeing my background as a disadvantage to recognizing its potential for connection. This realization fueled my commitment to supporting over five hundred senior high school female graduates including disabled students, through my accessing opportunities projects. This project is dedicated to training students on accessing and utilizing opportunities such as scholarship, business incubation, grants, demonstrating that despite... Okay, so, okay, uh, despite so let, me, let, let me stop you there. So you see that part, you can, yes. you can, you can, you can reduce the amount of words you use there. So that's so it's okay. the writing, writing estates. So again... Most most of these uh, essays require you to just write for like five hundred words. You don't need yes, to tell us exhaustively what your program seeks to do. It's sufficient to 
to communicate that you're doing something to help you. So it's sufficient to communicate that you are like turning back and reaching reaching out to also help other people. You know what I'm saying? Okay. But yes, it's, 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 I, I, I love I love that what you are sharing is consistent with your motivation, which we got from your own <laughs> statement. That consistency okay. is very important. That consistency always needs to be seen along the line. So let me read this one, right? Yes, so with a lifelong passion for history, I have developed an interest in the cultural history of early modern and modern Europeans, especially women's history. The experiences of ordinary women fascinate me. How they constitute their world through popular folk tales and literature. How the seemingly irrational, how the seemingly irrational paradoxes of the past to modern eyes are completely rational when taken within the historical context. So what this person is doing here is being reflective. And essays need to be reflective, even away from personal statements. The, the ability to be reflective and to synthesize from your from either your reading or your educational experience or just your personal experience, right? Because this person, what this person is seeing here is not repeating what they learned in class. They are telling them, they are telling us what fascinated them. So you see, that's reflection. So the experiences of ordinary women fascinate me. How they constitute their world through popular folks, folk tales and literature. So Aisha, for instance, your 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 point of reflection in your stories can be about how, despite the fact that you struggled to pay your fees so many years ago, that continues to exist. And it could also even you could also take a step away from that to be critical of some of the places you've had to work. When I say critical, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean to cast it in a bad light, but to talk about what the, the, um, the how, how effective the work of such organizations are. Because you're applying for a master's in education, meaning I'm guessing your goal is to come back and support educational policy and all of that, right? Ed delivery of education. Yes, exactly. So your points of reflection can also be about the curriculum and whether the extent to which that curriculum is effective. So what okay. you have done so far, the, the part where you talk about what you have done, so, sorry, whoever says I'm testing, uh, the part where you talk about what you have done so far needs to be reflective. It's not just a regurgitation of, oh, I have done this, I got first class, I went at the Ministry of Finance, I did this and that. It is an opportunity okay. for you to be reflective and for you to tell us that this is what you've seen from your experience. And you see, again, that reflection should inform your motivation, uh, should align with your motivation. If your motivation is to go do master's in education, uh, uh, if your motivation is to be at a position where you can contribute to educational policy or you can contribute to health policy, then your reflection on so again, let me use the example of the, the public health essay that I was talking about earlier. So this person starts by telling us that their mother's postpartum depression was what uh, motivated them to work in healthcare. And then they go on to tell us about where and where they work. And in doing so, they're not just like telling, oh, and I work here and I work that and I work here. Things we can already see in their CV. But they tell us how the access to healthcare in these specific places they work is very hard. Again, feeding into their motivation, contributing into healthcare. So even though you, like contributing to the delivery of healthcare is your larger motivation, the point of reflection can come from several places. It can even come from, and in this person's essay, it came from things like healthcare advocacy for minorities, for women, uh, getting obstetric um, healthcare, if, if, that's, if that's how you feel for another word. So you, you get what I'm saying? So you, your, what you have done should be reflected. Don't tell us you got best students. Don't tell us. I mean, it's nice. It's, it's you need to brag. You need to, you need to tell us that. But don't just drop it at that and stop. If your thing, if your whole thing is to brag about, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not using bragging here in a condescending or pejorative manner. I'm using bragging here as you have the right to brag, but your bragging should be reflected. So some people's brag tends to be about how hard it was for them to get the first class. I read an essay where the person talked about how in the first few terms, semesters, they were struggling. But at the end, they, want, they got the best graduating students. That is a proper brag. 
So you, again, you are communicating resilience. You are communicating your ability to be able to go through a rigorous academic program. Right. Now, reminding, reminding us about your why. This is what the person did, right? So my focus as an undergraduate has always been with an eye toward graduate school and a career as a professional historian. Aware of the rigors of graduate study, I have not only completed an undergraduate language requirement in Spanish, but I'm also currently enrolled in an accelerated French course. In addition, I have become active in the historical honor society, blah, 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 blah. With the help of faculty advisor, Dr. Julian Gillard, I created the conference sessions. So you see, this person here, in addition, again, is consistent, consistently, you see their why, but they're also telling you why they are making the leap from or how they're making the leap from undergraduate study to their masters. While this, whilst this person doesn't tell us the gap that they are trying to fill, but they are showing us that like, they understand that graduate studies is rigorous. And this is what they've done to, to prepare themselves for the rigor of graduate studies. So if you're doing education, if you're applying for a master's in education, like Asha is doing, and you've gone, so you've read through it, you understand what's, it's, what's needed of like the specific program you're applying for. And maybe your program is policy heavy. You can talk about the amount of, I mean, how, how much you've engaged with educational policy, the conferences you've attended, your interaction with it, the essays you've written for, for publication, whatever it is. You need to like communicate that to us. You need to communicate that to the, to the reader, to let the reader understand that, okay, this is what you've done in preparation. But if you choose, and I mean, this is great. Doing what you've done in preparation is always great, but not everyone has prepared that much for graduate studies. But if you choose to focus on the gaps in your studies, the gaps in your preparation, then that's where you need to do a lot more research and what is required of you at the end of the day. So if you want to do public health, and then you know that like you want to be a uh, you want to work in public health policy in Ghana, and then you know that okay. This is the specific area of public health policy that you want. And maybe what you want to do is more of advocacy focused. Then you can tell us that your study so far was not heavy on advocacy. You just went to class and you learned medicine or whatever it is, but you didn't understand advocacy. You didn't understand how to advocate for policy positions, uh, how to draft legislative um, stuff, bills and all of those things, right? And how after drafting it, how you make the advocacy. You know what I'm saying? So. You need to know exactly what it is you're applying for, what it is you want to do at the end of the day, and how the program you're applying for would uh, enable you to get to that point. So if for, for those who are doing maybe economics and stuff like that, your, your stuff is very heavy on quantitative analysis. You can tell us that like, yeah, you did econometrics, you used data, but data, well, I mean, you know that like, you need to have more advanced, maybe like calculus, you know, that kind of stuff. You, you people know, you know it better than I do. What is required of you in your master's studies? For me, in applying for a PhD, I know that, like for a law PhD and what I want to do, I know I need further grounding in theoretical analysis. And my master's has not given me that. And so that's why I'm applying for a PhD that's like heavy on legal theory. So you need to understand that. You need to know what exactly it is that like you currently have and what you don't have and what you need to have to get to the next point. And then we get to the final point which is the final point, which is you wooing the school. So, so far you've told the school a lot about yourself. You've told the school what you know, what you've done, blah, blah, blah. Then you need to come and tell us why you are applying to the school. And here, like I said, so that, so all what we've talked about so far, if you're applying to like multiple schools, you can work on that. And for each school that you're applying to, please and please do this. And don't forget to take it out when, it, like when you're applying to a different school. Sometimes people make that mistake. Maybe you're applying to Cornell, and then you, you have a draft for New York University, and then the person will be reading it, will come there, will see New York University, and will see that the name of a New York University lecturer. <laughs> you may, you're making the work of the admissions council very easy. We just throw away your stuff. So it's that, that this part is very, very important. I made, I made that mistake once. I was emailing a lecturer for a potential PhD supervisor. And I used the name of a different lecturer in a different school. Thankfully, the only lecturer who has gotten back to me was that person. So he was kind enough. But you might not be, I mean, you might not be lucky enough. So that is very, very dangerous. You need to be careful about that. Now here, you need to do the research. That's why no one's going to do the research for you. You need to do the research. And that research 
it's not enough to just go on the school and hear the school talking about it, care about diversity. You also come and say, I want to contribute to your diversity. Schools have got it, have got, have gone past just like taking you because you're a black student. In fact, there was a there's a recent there's a recent Supreme Court case in the US where they said they cannot make decisions solely on race. But if you're going to, if you being black from Ghana is your selling point, you should tell us exactly what about being black from Ghana is that selling point. So if you're applying to a program, a public health program that uh, focuses on on uh, mental health, you can talk about the unique experience of Ghana in 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 the fact that maybe like mental health is is we are still at, at a point in our in in our country's history where it's a stigma. People people will mistake genuine mental health cases for spiritual possession or whatever it is. And your experience with some of these things might contribute, might, might, might um, enhance the student's experience in sharing like some of these, some of these like um, experiences, right? That one might not even be like a strong point. I'm just using that off the top of my head. But I'm just, what I'm trying to see is you need to, you need to, you need to one, understand the school and know what the school seeks from their people and tell them how because of this specific thing that the school is doing, because of this specific lecturer who works in Aha. So you see, in particular, Dr. Arena Williams' specialty in the Stuart's social and cultural history complements my own interest in studying the experiences of English pre-industrial women. Very specific. Very specific. Don't tell, don't say you just want to, don't come and say, oh, I have interest in learning about income, income inequality, and this professor does income inequality work. That's not enough. Maybe she's doing income inequality in global South countries. Maybe she's doing research on alternative dispute resolution in Ghana or in Nigeria. And that's what she wants to do. Mention, the minute you mention it, it will align with them. They'll get excited. And again, if, it, it, I mean, master's students, uh, master's programs, most likely you need somebody to like supervise some work you're going to do. Some schools will ask you to have like that, uh, to make mention of who you want to supervise you. If what you want to work on is not the same thing that the person wants to work on, the person is not going to waste their time to like direct you because they, they, they just cannot like direct you. You get it. So you need to this part, this part, you need to do that work. You need to do that work heavily. It's not enough to just say, oh yeah, you do this, you do this course and your school is number one in the in the country or in this course. That's why I'm applying for. No. And like I was saying earlier, if you do your research and maybe you come across and see that okay, maybe they have this specific center. That does work in um, that uh, this specific research center that does this type of work. You can just go and do more research on that and make mention of it. Oh, this specific lecturer is doing this thing that's like adjacent to what I'm doing or perfect per uh, perfect fit for what I'm doing. You make mention of that too. So yeah, um, almost come to the end. Like this is the last part. Yes. So the don'ts. I've read some of your essays and yeah, some of these are some of the don'ts. Don't be generic. Don't be generic, especially in your introduction. Don't be generic. Please do something like what Aisha did. Give us a descriptive opening that tells a story about you or someone close to you, or even if it's not someone close to you, that leads to a, reflect a point of reflection. So don't be generic. Use your words. On this point, right, I know not all of us uh, have, have a way with words. I know writing, writing is something that like you cultivate, and unfortunately, Mm -hmm. country we don't we don't uh, have a lot we don't we don't focus on that a lot i went to legon and academic okay. writing that course they didn't they didn't teach it well to be honest what i'll suggest but you need to be careful about this so chat gpt can be good it can be a, it can be a helpful aid but don't use chat gpt to write your essays because the lecturers will find it out if you do chat like if you play around with chat GPT, you know, you know the, the way chat GPT writes. Like it is very it's, like the minute the minute I see a chat GPT recent essay, I know it. But all you can do with chat GPT is you can give you can feed it prompts. So you can say, write a paragraph on a child going to school in northern Ghana, blah 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 blah. Like you can have like a very specific prompt for chat GPT. It will give you that prompt. It, it will give. It will feed you. It will give you the answer, the response. However, rework it, re-edit it, so it's not too obvious that it's charging it. Don't you? Don't 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 send off your essay with way too many adjectives and too many descriptive words. Like it's nice to be descriptive, but ChatGPT will say in the in the in the hinterlands of Ghana where the sun shines, 
and set at this point and the dancing leads like those ones you don't need that so you're not applying for um, like a even if, even if you're applying for like a writing like a, a residency do through do throw away your essay like it's that's just like corny stuff but chat gpt can can help you in some ways but like i said be careful with this like be extra careful with it if you're struggling to be as descriptive as you need to be Maybe you can you can make use of that, but be careful. Like I said, and I, I I have to emphasize that I've seen on LinkedIn, I've seen so many professors talk about how they keep on getting um chat GPT responses. Like sometimes they'll see they'll get like an email from people maybe like inquire, trying to inquire about uh, potential uh, PhD supervision, and almost every single student is using the same format. So be careful about that, please. I said don't be generic. You can use ChatGPT to help you, but don't use it too much. Very, very careful. I need to emphasize that. Number two, don't repeat your transcript and CV. Don't tell us every single course you've taken. If you're going to tell us the courses you've taken, it should be relevant. It should lead back to what you're applying for. So let me use economics. Economics, you maybe you did economics and uh, political science. You took a course on um, the economics. We did public finance. We did uh, economy of Ghana and stuff like that. If, for instance, you're applying for a microeconomics master's or a macroeconomics master's, you don't need to be telling us about like econo economy, uh, economic growth and development. It has little bearing on that. You can talk about the math courses that you took, the stat courses that you, you took, the calculus and stuff like that. And even with that one, don't tell us that, oh, I got A in it. Like, again, be reflective about it. Be very reflective about it. Don't drop, don't just name drop every single page you've worked. And don't mention the names of your professors. They don't know them. Unless it is a school that knows them or your professor is a, the, the professor at your school in Ghana is a notable person and you did research with them. That might be a, like a selling point. But if there's some random professor in Ghana who no one knows, don't no, no waste your time. Do, do not use salutations. I see people write, yes, Serge, to madam. Thank you. For, like, don't do that. You don't need that. It's an essay. Do not forget to edit. Please find someone other than yourself to read through it and edit it. The thing about writing is sometimes if you write it yourself, you have blind spots. So let someone else read it. This point, poverty porn is outdated. What poverty porn means is like, don't, don't focus too much on talking about how poor you are and how hard you, how hard you had it. It's, it's, it's enough to just talk about points of like hardships here and there, but don't, don't make that your whole thing. Don't make that your whole thing. Give a bit more than promising to be to improve diversity. Like I said, don't just say you're going to improve the diversity of the student body because you're a black student. You have to give them a bit more. You have to tell them how exactly you're going to improve the diversity. Is there some research you did? Is there some specific experience? What, what, what specifically is it? Don't just say you're going to contribute to the student diversity and improve it. Tell us specifically what are you going to do? Like what specifically are you going to do? And this one, you're able to do that if you show that you actually did your research. So yeah, I think I've been talking for 70 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I'll stop here. We can take questions and um, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, um, lawyer Shafiq. I oh, think no problem, it's, been, it's, just it's been, <laughs> well, it's been a great session and I'm sure we've all learned a lot from it. Um, we have less than 10 minutes left. I think we have eight minutes to go. So we have to be very quick with the questions so that we can touch on it. Maybe we can take like two or three questions if the time will permit. So we have to be very quick with it. Else we'll have to rejoin again. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm willing to rejoin if there's sustained interest. But like I said, most of you guys have like what, December 1st as your deadline. So if you have specific questions, please ask it here. Yeah. So Hello, yeah, I, I have a it. question. Yeah, sure. Very good. Um, you mentioned not using chat GPT and providing specifics. Does the specifics include like drafting things around what you want to represent and then asking chats to put it together for you? Yes. So so for instance. Um, if, if maybe you are struggling to communicate, if say maybe your thing is about the opening and you are, you want to talk about, say you're applying for a, master, to a master's in uh, economics, again, because that's what I know. And you want, you, uh, 
microeconomic theory or whatever, or like macroeconomics, talking about like the economy and all of that. And you want to describe um, something about unemployment and how two, three years after school, you've been struggling. And you just want to talk about how maybe you're going up and down in a crowd with your CV and all of those things. You can have like a prompt that says, write a 50 word, a 50, uh, write a 50 word sentence or essay talking about a student in a crash struggling to get a job. Chat GPT will do a good job with it. Chat GPT, wait, let me let me see. Um let me let me try and go to chat GPT right now and see something. Okay, so let me see. Write a 50 word essay on an unemployed student, on an unemployed person looking for a job in Accra. Wait, can you guys see my screen? Hello? No. no. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay, so so let me let me let me show you what Chad GPT says says in the bustling city of Accra, an unemployed individual navigates the challenges of job hunting. Armed with their resilience and determination, they tirelessly seek opportunities to contribute to their skills and talents. Amidst the vibrant tapestry of the city, this journey embodies the hope for a new chapter and a chance for and a chance at meaningful employment. It's nice, but it's a bit too wordy. So what you can do again is to ask ask another prompt. So so you keep on like changing it. But like if it is okay for you, you can use it. But don't 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 use it in a manner that is too obvious that like you got it from Chat GPT. That's what I'm saying. Um, but like I said, use it sparingly, only in instances where you are actually actually struggling to um to come up with the words. But if you have someone close to you who can come up with the words for you, I'd rather you do that than use Chat GPT. I'm only saying Chat GPT just so like in instances where you are you don't have any other option, you want to fall back on it. But even when you fall back on it, always when you, when you send it, the essay to somebody who's editing it to them, point out that I guess. Chat GPT produce prompts. If the person can help you like change it, it'll be better for you. Yeah, that's what I meant by that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh how, how many of you have drafts ready? Lisa, I have a question. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. What if the school asks you to produce two writing statements? That's a statement of purpose different and a personal statement to different because some schools also caution that don't repeat the same thing in each statement you are providing. How do you navigate with that one? So they ask you, you said they ask you to produce two statements, a statement of purpose yes. and a statement of what? And a personal statement. It tends to be the same thing, unless unless the they they ask you to write specific things. So a school might ask you to um, talk about what is important to you. So that one you are very specific. So that one's not like a personal statement. So what is important to you can be with those ones. Don't go and talk about talk about things that are emotive, i.e. Will, will trigger an emotional response from the other person. So you can talk about maybe um, empathy, compassion, tolerance, intercultural, um, intercultural communication, diversity, some of these things, right? So that, that one is different. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So in those instances, yeah, that's what she writes. So yeah, so yes, it, uh -huh. somebody said it's the same, yeah. Personal statement, statement of purpose, you're the same. Unless the essay, oh. unless the the, the prompt is is different. So some of the prompts might ask you to respond to a specific question. Tell us a, a, a time in your life where where you had to overcome challenges. So that one is different from you you writing your personal statements. You know what I'm saying? So your personal statement is you telling them what is motivating you to apply. And then tell us a point in time where something motivated you, like uh, uh, you have to overcome a, a challenge or you telling them what is important to you. That's also very different. So please, uh, like the one I just read, they asked of a personal statement and statement of purpose. And then the personal statement was asking about your background, the diversity, everything. That's what I just read. And mm -hmm. then the statements of purpose talk about your background and the program, your interest, and why the school and everything. Right. So it was personal statement and statements of purpose, but they gave us a prompt. A prompt, that was, uh -huh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. 
yeah, so that's the thing. Like you need to be very careful about the forms. Yeah, they are they they ask they require specific like things from you. Yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um Aisha. Um yeah. Yeah, um, um, please, um I'm mm -hmm. applying to uh Manitoba and they're asking for biographical sketch. Please can you talk a bit about that? That so that also so that's that's like uh what say myself, I know myself. That's like a myself, but you are you you again more reflective. You need to be reflective about it. So your biograph biographical sketch is you talking about your life up till now. But then don't just name drop what you've done. Be, be reflective about it. So when you, if you're going to use a biographical sketch, at the at, at the get go, know that okay, maybe I want to communicate resilience. And in communicating resilience, I'm showing at every spot, at every point in time, how I've like skilled this header or that header. I think it will be shutting down in a minute. So we'll join again and hopefully we'll just end in like 20 minutes. But yeah, that's what like a biographical sketch is like. Like what you've been through up till now, and then by again, you need to be very reflective. Don't just like drop things. These people like reflection. They like it. To, they like seeing that like you've gone through these experiences and you've been able to think through what these experiences mean to you and how you've come out of it. And the other thing I'll say is, if you know someone who has been to these specific schools, you can always reach out to them and ask them to see um to see samples of what they used to get it. That that always tends to be like a better thing. Okay, so actually, I took one from a student there, and his own talk about his experiences in agriculture yes. and mostly about his achievements in the agriculture mm -hmm. sector. We are applying for agriculture economy, so exactly. Uh huh. So, you see, so again, being 